Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Dan of the Berkeley Public Library, and this is the latest installment of Farm to Shelf. Today, we'll be uh, preparing a mung bean soup, and then we'll be having a panel discussion on food security in Berkeley. Um, so let me just bring up my script here. OK. Um, so I just want to introduce our panel. Uh, we have Holden Bussey, who's the kitchen manager for the Berkeley Food Network. And we have Natalie Crelly Zapponi, a nutritionist with the city of Berkeley. And Anna Pareda, program specialist with Fresh Approach. And my colleague Esther Suarez uh, with Berkeley Reads, which is the library's literacy program. Um, so I just want to give a friendly reminder that this event is being recorded. And um, you have, if you have questions for the panel, just please put them in the Q&A box. And you can follow us on Instagram at Berkeley Public Library and on Facebook at Berkeley Public Library as well. Um, Farm to Shelf is a series of library programs that spotlight local culinary professionals, businesses, organizations, cookbook authors, and chefs who feature cooking demos for our audience. Um, at today's Farm to Shelf event, we're going to show you a pre-recorded demo of Esther making a delicious mung bean soup, followed by the panel discussion and Q&A on food security in our community. Uh, before we get started, we want to thank the foundation of the Berkeley Public Library for funding the event, uh, as well as the Berkeley's Charlie Cart, which Esther uses during the preparation of the mung bean soup. Um, we also want to thank our panelists for being so incredibly generous with their time, skills, and expertise with us. And um, be sure you subscribe to our social media feeds where you can get announcements about future programs. Now, I mentioned that we uh, are recording the event. Um, if that makes you uncomfortable, please feel free to exit at any time. Um, and you can use the Q&A button to submit questions um, at any time. And we'll get to those towards the end of the program. And we will try to answer as many as we can. All right. So Esther, do you want to um, give a brief introduction about the mung bean soup? I'm sure. So mung beans. Um, you know, I have to just quickly say, I didn't grow up eating mung beans. I grew up on a Caribbean diet and a lot of pinto beans and black beans, but no mung beans. And when I discovered them later in life, I just fell in love. Um, this recipe, I especially love this recipe because it's so simple to make. It's a very few ingredients. Um, as much as I love spices, um, you can get a lot of that spicy flavor out of the ingredients we have, um, ginger and celery, and garlic. Um, um, I'll talk a little bit about it. But uh, mung beans also, you know, it's an ancient bean. It's been around for a minute. like. 1500 BC, the Indian subcontinent, and then it spread throughout Asia into Africa, and then uh, later into the Americas, um, and just so rich in protein. Um, it, it's just having two cups of mung beans a day, you know, you can get up to 28 grams of fiber. I'm sorry, not a day. I have mung beans like once a week, actually. <laughs> but, um, you know, and then it's super high in fiber. So like uh, two cups of mung beans, you can get like 30 grams of fiber right there. So really delicious. And, and it also helps to reduce blood pressure. It's got a host of nutritional benefits, lowers blood cholesterol, all this wonderful stuff that folks should, you know, give it a try. If you're not used to it, um, there's uh, so many different ways. People make um, dolls and, and desserts and pastes out of it. And they also, um, you know, a lot of the plant-based folks have been putting it into their alternative meats and eggs. And so it's just, you can make pancakes out of it. It's incredibly diverse. So I really give, you know, I want to give, you know, a shout out to this bean and um, hopefully folks will give it a try. And um, I did use coconut milk in the recipe and you could substitute that for oat, uh, oat milk if you're concerned about you know, levels of saturated fat or when it comes to coconut milk, you can always use light coconut milk too to kind of lower that um, as well. So, so yeah, check out the recipe. Um, hope you enjoy the music. All right. Go for it. 
I'm going to go ahead and share the video. It's going to take okay. just a second. Uh, just a second. Let's see here. So bring that back up.
Thanks, Esther. Yeah, I forgot to add to, um, so another way to eat mung beans is sprouted mung beans. Um, so easy, nutritious. Um, some folks have it stir fried. I like putting it in my salad. Um, it's a great earthquake backpack food. If you have some beans in your backpack and you can some water, you have instant food in a couple of days of sprouting. So um, just think about incorporating them cooked or sprouted however you want. Um, and I know there's a lot of coconut in that dish. Sorry, I grew up on a Caribbean diet. We ate a lot of coconuts. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. um, I'd be happy to share that recipe um, for the coconut rice as well anytime with folks. Yeah, we can email that out to all the attendees after the program. Yeah. Um, and one thing I wanted to mention, you were using an induction burner in that demo. And um, the tool lending library in Berkeley now has in induction burners that we're lending out to people as a part of our kitchen tool collection. Yeah. So if you want to experiment with new cooking techniques and appliances, um, and you're a Berkeley resident, just come down to the tool library and we'll get you registered. We have, um, besides the induction burners, we have food dehydrators, uh, sous vide cookers, instant pots, air fryers, ice cream makers, all kinds of fun stuff to play with. But why don't we move on to our discussion now? And um, I'll give each of the panelists a chance to introduce themselves. Um, we can go in alphabetical order here. Uh, Anna, would you like to talk a little bit about your role at uh, Fresh Approach and the work you do? Sure. Um, just that's a question. So just introduce myself or? Um... Um, yeah, and just talk about fresh approach in the work. And to talk doing. about, okay, perfect. So my name is Ana Pereira. I'm the nutrition education program specialist at Fresh Approach. I started about eight months ago and I mainly work within the nutrition education team. Um, a little bit about the organization, Fresh, for those that you um, haven't heard about us, um, Fresh Approach is a nonprofit organization that was born in 2008 and it's located in the east and the south bay um, our mission is to improve healthy food access around the bay area communities and we bring locally grown produce nutrition education and gardening gardening skill building building to bay area communities our programs empower families to make sustainable life changes by expanding their nutrition knowledge cooking and gardening skills and by boosting their access to local affordable produce um, as I said before, the education teams host what we call the VegRx Cooking and Nutrition class, which, is, which are free nutrition and cooking classes. The program helps family make healthier choices in a way that it's fun, accessible, and practical. Um, families and individuals in general. We also have a community garden located in East Palo Alto to foster urban agriculture and teach South Bay residents how to grow their own food, reduce food waste, and prepare their own compost. And we actually have one class that is happening right now for Berkeley residents, so I'll share some information through the chat. Um, we also have our food access team that increases access to highest quality food by um, increasing access points and ability of folks to afford a higher cost local foods. Our sourcing guidelines are centered at farmers owned, farms owned by people of color, women, and those with sustainable practices. And our current pro programming includes mobile, far mobile farmers market routes. Um, we have two in the East Bay and two in the South Bay, and I'll share the information about East Bay routes in the chat as well. Um, we also have one traditional farmer's market in the East Palo Alto community and participation in the Richmond Certified Farmer's Market. All locations provide Market Match, which is a national initiative where EBT beneficiaries can obtain, obtain up to $20 when they use their EBT card to get fruits and veggies at farmer's markets. And we also provide uh, an expanded match to other state and federal benefits. Other farmers markets also participate in market in market match too. Um, for example, here in Berkeley, you can use your EBT card at any of the Berkeley farmers markets, and you can get money um, double up up to ten dollars per day. 
So you can stop by the information booth at the market when you arrive and use your EBT um, dollars at the farmer's market. Another short uh, part of our organization during 2020, there was a dramatic increase in the demand for food. And at the same time, farmers were also at risk of losing their business due to the pandemic and our wealth buyers um, season. Mm -hmm. This emerged to the coordination and distribution of 110,000 emergency food boxes. And this effort meant that more than $2 million were invested in our local farms and around 600,000 pounds of fruits and veggies were distributed. If you want to participate in our programs, you can always visit our website, website to stay up to date and you're gonna be able to sign up to our various newsletters depending on what your interest is. Um, and we're going to be, as I said, hosting a 10 class drop-in series in Berkeley residence. So you can sign up through the link that I'll be giving through the chat. And that's it from me and my organization. Fresher Coach did a, uh, a series of cooking classes at the library a few years back, and I was really impressed at how you were able to connect like seasonal produce with uh, practical recipes that anybody could really make in their homes. And at the end of each class, we all had a really nice dinner together, so it was a fun program. Esther, do you want to talk about uh, your work at Berkeley Reads? Oh, I thought I was going last. Why don't we go? Oh, okay, sure. Holden, do you want to go? <laughs> More than happy to go. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Honored to be on this panel. Um, so I'm Holden Bussey, and I work uh, at the Berkeley Food Network. Um, and I've been in this role uh, for just over a year, so a very pandemic-centric uh, time here. But our goal uh, is really to alleviate food insecurity within Berkeley and Albany. Um, and we kind of start from this acknowledgement that the existing food system is full of inequities and inefficiencies, um, and a lot of lack of access to healthy food um, is a byproduct of these. Um, and it is really not an issue of production, but rather an issue of distribution. So with acknowledging that uh, kind of foundation, that fundamental reality, we address this through our onsite pantry, through our mobile pantry program, um, and through food recovery. So in the idea of, uh, you know, inequitable distribution. We currently have mobile pantries that are open to the public um, every Tuesday, and they alternate between Berkeley High School um, and Berkeley Technical Academy. Those are open to the public. And then we also have targeted distribution at local elder care facilities, um, as well as Albany High School. Um, and if anyone listening is interested in developing a distribution in your community, please let us know, and we'd be more than happy to do that. Um, in addition to that, one thing that's been unfortunate during the pandemic is that our client choice model, which gives folks agency over exactly what uh, they choose to, to get, has been hampered just due to the spatial realities of not being able to gather. Um, so we've started to do pre-packed bags. Um, and so we distribute these uh, to, through BUSD school system every other Friday. We also bring these to YMCA Head Start programs. Um, as well as many other community organizations. Uh, and our goal is to really just saturate um, the area with as much nutrient dense food as possible while still minimizing the amount of waste that's associated with that, which is why we really advocate for the client choice model. Um, and we are really excited to, to shift back towards that um, and away from the pre-packed bags. Uh, another unfortunate reality of our food system is food waste. Um, agriculture from a global scale produces about 35% of total carbon emissions. Um, and at the same time in this country, 40% of what we produce goes to waste. So our food recovery program is really a core tenant of what we do. Um, so we work with farms, wholesale purveyors, local restaurants, um, and a variety of other organizations, Safeways, Trader Joe's. Um, and currently we're recovering over 40,000 pounds monthly of you know, food waste. Uh, and with that food, we have a variety of distribution streams. So if it's a quality product that we can directly distribute to our clients, we will do that. Um, but if it's something that might not be aesthetically pleasing or might be a little bit wilted or something like that, we have our hub kitchen program. Um, and so this is run by our kitchen manager, Marla, as well, and it's 
all done through volunteers. Um, we operate three days a week, and last year we were able to produce over 40,000 meals, which were distributed uh, free of charge to community members. Um, Natalie can speak to that as uh, Aging Services uh, was the beneficiary of some of those meals. And that's a program that we're really hoping to continue to expand because it's just connecting food waste with folks who don't have access to nutrient-dense foods. And it's also really effective for folks that might be homebound or might be kitchenless. Um, I think that's kind of the gist of what we do. We also are working on a home delivery program. Um, that's become something that's glaring during this pandemic is a lot of folks can't access groceries in the traditional means. So how can we provide those groceries for folks? So please reach out if you're interested in receiving home delivery as it's a pilot program that we're working on. Um, and I think objectively, you know, we view food as a uh, innately human reality. And so we're trying to build a resilient local food economy within Berkeley. Um, and so it's, it's an honor to be able to work with so many different programs who are collectively, uh, you know, everyone has their, their little piece that they're playing. Um, and uh, kind of getting to back what Anna was saying, uh, we are beginning to purchase food from um, local organic regenerative farmers um, in the hopes of kind of shifting the capital uh, to the producers um, that historically have lacked access both to markets and to land. So we realize that the food system is a very complex dynamic thing that needs both, you know, the band-aid of feeding assistant, but we also need to provide the medicine at a higher level and ultimately treat these root causes of the disease of food insecurity. So it's a very exciting time to be able to work on all of these different levels. Um, and I'm excited to hear from everyone else about how we can continue to make uh, a resilient food economy within Berkeley. Hi, do you wanna go, Natalie? Sure, yes, happy to. Um, so thanks for having me on this panel. I really appreciate it. And um, it's been nice to work with Holden and Anna as well. Um, Holden and I share a parking lot. So I don't know if you could see where his location is. Yeah, I'm sort of just around the corner. Um, but my name's Natalie krell Saponi, and I'm the Registered Dietitian for City of Berkeley's Aging Services and then some work with public health as well. Um, in that role, I work with um, our caterer. So we're a federally funded nutrition program for older adults, 60 plus. And um, the programs that most people would recognize are uh, Meals on Wheels as well as our senior centers. So as we know, our senior center has been closed for over a year. Um, so we had to transition to some other ways of providing food, uh, which I'll review. Um, I do have something to share, so I'm going to try to do that right now. Uh, let's see. It is not there. It is not there. It is here. Okay. Let's see if that goes. Okay. So I just wanted to give sort of an overview of some of our programming. Um, this is um, a lot of information, so I'll just kind of go through it. Uh, like I said, it's Meals on Wheels, and basically that's for Berkeley residents who are age 60 plus, homebound, or have pretty solid difficulty getting food consistently for themselves. Um, you know, Meals on Wheels are is basically worldwide, and um, within our country, it's mostly federally funded, um, which sort of means that the menus and the meals are um, sort of similar to like a school lunch program where you have to have very specific and no ketchup doesn't count as a vegetable or fruit. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, I think our caterer, they're local, they're called Nutrition Solutions Incorporated based in Alameda. They do a fantastic job. I mean, we, we are always um, so pleased to hear from um, our clients about how much they like the food. So, you know, it's, it, it's, it's great if you can get food to folks and that it tastes good. So they're eating it and enjoying it. Um, so Meals on Wheels, yeah, 60 plus, um, homebound, um, and it's, you know, everything is uh, sort of loosely called a sliding scale, but basically it's donation based. If you can afford to donate something, then we are happy to, you know, work that donation into our funding. If you cannot, you don't. So it's, it's as simple as that. We deliver meals Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, um, um, anywhere from three to seven meals uh, per week. And part of the meal bags usually contain some supplemental groceries as well. Um, some from Berkeley Food ne Network, as well as some from Mercy Brown Bag, which I'll discuss. Again, more details are on this um, handout I'm sharing. Um, the other program that we're offering right now, because our senior centers are, is, are closed, is called the Grab and Go program. 
And that's basically a one day a week, Tuesdays from 11.30 to 1, with pickup at the South Berkeley Senior Center. It's curbside, people just drive through, some walk up, um, and it, it runs long enough to really accommodate a, a, a lot of people. Um, so it's five frozen meals that, that we uh, offer, plus the sides, plus supplemental groceries and produce, also with um, working with Berkeley Food Network. Um, we have done some grocery bags, sort of bags, as Holden was saying, but we're trying to transition to client choice out there as well. And so just really starting that process. So we can look forward to some more of that. Um, and then also the Mercy Brown Bag Program is another uh, program that we offer. Um, some of it, much of it's getting delivered right now, as Golden has said, that is um, really been an issue for folks. It's how to get this food, how to access it. So Mercy Brown Bag is uh, two Fridays uh, per month, and it's got a lot of great food in it, um, just an assortment depending on what is available. And um, that is, that is um, in meet, meeting certain income requirements, so lower income. Um, other food options, uh, Berkeley, well, Berkeley Mutual Aid has been a great partner with us. They are helping um, on an individual basis to get um, food picked up or, or delivered to some of our folks. Um, HelpBerkeley.org is another prepared meal uh, program in Berkeley since the pandemic, and um, that's one that a lot of our case managers who work with our older adult population are referring to if they are looking for even more options. Um, and then CalFresh. I, you know, CalFresh is um, it's a federal nutrition program that provides monthly benefits uh, to buy nutrition food, and it comes on a debit card. And um, it, not everybody uh, is eligible, but it's definitely worth a phone call. It's definitely worth the process, um, I think, to see what eligibility might look like. Because uh, it just makes that food uh, budget grow, just stretches it. So um, I would encourage people to do that. And I've got a little bit of information on, on CalFresh. Federally, it's called um, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP. Um, and the old name was food stamps. So if it sounds sort of familiar, that's what that was. Um, but yeah, so the contacts for that are on the handout as well. Um, I think that's it for me for now. Excellent. All right, Esther, do you want to go? Sure. So how is the library program involved with this food stuff? <laughs> um, and Berkeley Reads, um, if you don't know about our program, uh, we've actually been around since 1987, so 34 years now, providing adult and family literacy services. Um, and that's largely driven by our wonderful community volunteers. Um, so lots of people come out, we train them, and they work one-on-one -on -one with our students. Um, and it's not just the one-on-one -on -one, uh, tutoring. We've done lots of things. We address computer literacy issues. Um, we've gone on cultural arts field trips. Um, we've also done uh, a lot of work on the Easy Voter Guide uh, workshops and citizenship test support, uh, book clubs, adult learner leaderships, uh, Berkeley Build Readers. Uh, it goes out to many Head Start programs. So. So really, you know, our boss, um, Linda, you know, I've known her for a long time now, and, and her main focus has been like, what's the community need? What's the outreach? What are we doing? And so, um, and I was so happy that um, 10 years ago, she was like, when I brought up the idea, of, can we do health literacy and like address this issue with um, food insecurity? Um, she was like, go for it. So, um, and at that time too, we actually had a little edible garden uh, growing here at the West Branch, it was really beautiful. Um, and uh, so, so my focus has largely just been around the utilization aspect of food insecurity. So once you have the food, how are you consuming it? How are you utilizing it? So um, are you looking at, because most folks, if you're eating standard American diet, you're really starving for nutrition. Um, and so we really want to look at, you know, and I saw this with my students. I saw a lot of students coming in just, just tired a lot. And, and you ask them questions like, what's going on? What are you, you know, when food has a lot to do with it. Um, so just looking at, you know, the impact we can have with addressing issues around culinary literacy. 
culinary medicine because food, you know, can uh, be a very effective form of medicine for many people. Um, so I've done a lot with my coworker Sherry Austin. Um, we've We've done a lot of food demos here. Folks have been very happy eating a lot of the food. Um, and I've gone out to um, the adult school, the senior centers, um, to other community nonprofits, the Head Start, local community college. We've done this, just a lot of just trying to get out there as, uh, just like these other uh, panelists and trying to help people uh, get access to, to food and talk about quality food. Um, and so, so yeah, and since the pandemic, um, we've just been online. So I offer all the health classes bi-weekly now online and um, just continue to share resources. And just like this beautiful, this is a small selection of the beautiful books we have here. Um, so always interested in connecting with people about, about food and this is a free, the best thing about this too, which is what I love the other, what the other programs are doing is that this is free. Like I've always believed in free education and free food. It's a basic human right. So I'd love to see this nonsense of food anger, uh, food hunger end <laughs> in my lifetime. <laughs> but anyway, um, so, so yeah, that's, that's basically what we're doing now. We're always interested in finding new volunteers and right now volunteers that are happy to or feel comfortable um, tutoring online is the focus, and for me, especially volunteers that want to help address food insecurity issues and, and do food demos with me, I'd be more than happy to talk to folks. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Um, so for all of our attendees, if you want to submit some questions, you can type those into the Q&A box, but um, I think we're going to get started with a discussion and um, Esther, did you want to lead us off with a question? Um, well, yeah, I think, um, you know, there's, there's some myths about this. So I'd like the panelists to kind of help address that. What are some myths that you think about? Well, actually, because I, I did hear you guys, uh, well, it's Holden, you described what food insecurity is, like what's the definition of it? Um, and so if you can just address that for us, like how would you define it and what are some myths about it that the public, you wish the public understood better? Anybody can answer. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm happy to answer. Yes, so in my estimation, food insecurity is not having access um, to fresh nutrient dense food. Um, and I think it's impossible to evaluate this without acknowledging the socioeconomic legacy of inequity in this country um, and then also kind of looking at where our federal subsidies going for food production um, and I think Anna and Fresh Approach makes a great point in the sense that if you go to a store um, oftentimes an organic local item pretty much all the time will be more expensive than a conventionally produced monocropped industrial agriculture product. Um, and that cost to me is artificial in the sense that while there is that uh, higher cost and the store, the reason for that discrepancy is largely due to hidden costs, such as poor worker conditions, um, environmental degradation that's associated with those agriculture practices, and then ultimately where federal subsidies go and what type of agriculture and what crops those subsidies are supporting. Um, and in this country, a lot of those subsidies go towards corn, go towards soy. Um, and then oftentimes those crops are really not even for human consumption until uh, they are animal feed. And then we can see that result by the fact that a hamburger down the street is much cheaper than a salad. So I do think that it's important to acknowledge the, uh, the broader landscape um, and why for the consumer, it creates the uh, unfortunate reality that the healthier option has a higher cost. Thank you, that's critical. It's so, so much that we just don't think about, right? We don't see that. But all we see is what's in our face when we go to the store and so many people, yes, they have to say no to, to organic, unfortunately. Um, uh, you mentioned earlier that the food bank is offering organic produce as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're actively looking at 
how we can reimagine what feeding assistance is. Everything we give away is for free. But once again, there are a lot of hidden costs associated with a conventional celery crop um, that gets to us from Mexico. So in an instance like that, we are evaluating, okay, do we have the capital to shift our sourcing away from these conventional agriculture methods and instead support local farmers, which will in many ways um, alleviate some level of food insecurity um, and also provide a higher quality product to our clients. So much of what we uh, have on our food pantry out here now is organic and we're looking to get more and more of those organic products in here because the health of our clients and also the health of our natural world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Natalie, I'm curious um, uh, when it comes to working with seniors, are there some challenges you feel that, you know, when it comes to getting the food to them, how could we support you with that? Or what's, what are some myths that people have about it? Those are good questions, Esther. Um, I, you know, one of the first things that come to mind when I think about a myth about like Meals on Wheels is, oh, it's Meals on Wheels. The food must be really bad. Yeah. It's really good. I mean, you know, we, when food, if clients aren't home and we can't keep distributing it um, to the next client, maybe on a route, um, it comes back to the program and we don't refreeze that or you know provide that to more clients. So that becomes sort of like volunteer or staff meal essentially. So it doesn't go to waste. Um, and so we're literally every every volunteer, everybody's tried our food, even my teen boys. Mm -hmm. And it's like, this tastes good. We like this food. So um, I, I feel very proud um, working with our caterer that we we provide very nice product. Um, so I would encourage people to, you know, just really explore their Meals on Wheels programs in their communities, um, because besides the food, it's also some eyes on um, that comes, you know, once to three or four or five times a week, which is incredibly valuable from just a, a health and wellness perspective. Um, it's just one more person checking in. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's food and so much more generally, um, plus all the wraparound services. Um, uh, yeah, delivery is tricky. Um, we typically are nearly 100% volunteer driven, uh, and pre pandemic, that was exactly our situation. As soon as, uh, we had to stay home, we lost probably 80% of our volunteers because most of them are retired. So they felt compelled, of course, to, you know, stay shelter in place. Um, so we were fortunate, I mean, Berkeley is very committed to its seniors and, um, and supporting all of our programming. So we were fortunate where we could bring in paid staff to um, kind of fill in those gaps. And, you know, we've, we sort of ebbed and flow throughout this year with, with, um, with volunteers in and out. We're probably back to like 60 to 70 percent volunteers again. Um, especially as the vaccinations are coming out, so people are feeling more compelled and more comfortable to get back out. Um, but yeah, I, I, I feel like for any of our programs, that that has to be a huge volunteer component. Um, you know, we've got people who drive, we've got people who walk on routes, and we have cycling routes. Um, and so we try, you know, Berkeley is a relative, other than the hills, we're, we can be pretty level, so the, the bikes work pretty well for that. Some communities like San Francisco would actually be sort of hard on a bike route, but you're in pretty good shape <laughs> basically yeah. for doing that. So, um, yeah, that's that's a big piece though is is delivery. You know, the Mercy Brown Bag program that's just twice a month. Uh, we did almost exclusive home delivery for that, and that again, you know, when a lot of our city programs uh, had to transition to working from home and providing services from home people had some space to do some support of a program like aging services, nutrition programs. So we had a lot of support from other programs in Berkeley with our staff who were delivering those Mercy Brown Bag grocery bags. Um, and of course that, that, that ebbs and flows too. So um, we'll, we'll be looking for more volunteers with those too. It's, it's just a hard one and it's super important. You gotta get the food to the people and if, and if they can't come to you to get it, even as many opportunities as you might offer in different locations and times of day and different days. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I know you guys are rocking it because I've heard a good number of our students say, you know, when I've asked them since the pandemic, how are you doing with food? They're like, 
oh, Mercy Brown Bag, my refrigerator is full. <laughs> like they, they have really been using the services. So that's great. You know, they just feel very supported that way. Um, and um, Anna, I want to give a, a shout out to your nutrition classes. I've, I've been taking some of them with some of our students because they like to be there together with me. And um, it's, it's been really sweet. And I feel like folks, um, the CalFresh, like it's just beautiful that with your class, Anna, you're giving folks the, the money to go shopping. Um, and so I'm always like, I'm giving these out to students all the time saying, you don't, you know, get into this if you can. Um, is there anything you want to else you want to share about that class, Anna, when it comes to the benefits and um... Yeah, so part of what we do um, within our nutrition class is that we give voucher prescription, um, produce prescription vouchers as a way to also incentivize participants to go and shop at local farmers markets and start doing that behavior change and going back to what Holden was saying that maybe it might be a little bit more expensive on the first time that you go, but you're, the way that we see it at Fresh Approach and the way that it stopped within the organization is that you're reinvesting the money into a pool of resources that's gonna create like a positive feedback loop within our community. So we're not trying um, more than just giving nutrition education and making like knowledge available to everyone. We want to encourage and strengthen our local food system as part of the mission that we have as an, as an organization. So we really think that like um, one of my favorite parts of being part of this organization is that everything feels integrated. And although we don't really, um, we are basically two teams that work on different spheres. However, the nutrition and education is constantly trying to send people to our food access teams. And because if you're in the East Bay, um, I'll really take the opportunity and go to our mobile farmers market routes. Um, we do have discounted prices and it's almost like going to the cheapest grocery store and you're getting like the highest quality produce that you can get around here. So that does really create change and not only for the eater, it also creates change for the for the producer of the food, which is a really big part of the pro of the problem that it's almost hidden as Holden was saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what are the statistics now? Does anyone know how, how many folks have are food insecure at the moment? I think Holden, you you had a response. Yeah, I know that pre-pandemic we were looking at twenty-six thousand uh, folks within uh, Berkeley reported food insecurity, um, and I don't believe there's been any comprehensive data done um, post-pandemic or mid-pandemic. Um, but I think it's fair to say, with all of the economic turbulence, that that number has increased. Wow. Yeah, and it's tragic. It's definitely that's it's a tragedy uh, because again, it should be a it should be a human right. No one should go hungry. Um, and what can we do, um, you know, for folks that want to help but they don't have the time or, uh, to volunteer or the money to donate? How do we get this word out? How do we, you know, get to that twenty-six thousand? I think that the first step is like interest and information. Yeah. Um, just being here and knowing that there's a problem. And wanting to contribute is a first step to like having a solution. One of the things is that you can start like following organizations like Fresh Approach or like the Berkeley Foot, um, Fair Foot Network or the pro programs that you do at Berkeley Library and know what's happening within the food sphere and spreading the word is a very good portion to do. Um, maybe it's not just me, but I feel like since one of the big barriers um, within my work is like outreach and getting to the people that we want to get um, or like the, our, I wouldn't say the most in needs, but like the people that we really want to target, um, it's usually hard to 
to reach. So like spreading the word is a very, very good way to help. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree with Anna. Um, you know, we've got folks who can uh, volunteer their time. We have people with resources who can donate and then everybody else, if we can just participate and share the word, um, that's, that's the best thing because we've got programs to give. So it's just really nice when we can keep giving without having to almost make that a huge extra task, which sometimes can be hard in our days where you're already tasked to just keep the food flowing in and out. Um, so just the extra uh, support with outreach and sharing the good news is huge. Yeah. I want to, um, CW, one of our attendees, asked a question here. So I want to give everyone a chance to answer this. Um, CW says, hi, I work in food banking where we are collectively evolving our approach to meeting needs around hunger to address nutrition and cultural preference. What process do you recommend we keep awareness around when stewarding decisions around food we procure and distribute? Yeah, I think that is such a relevant question. Um, because ultimately, unless food is appropriate for the recipient, it is not doing good. Um, so one thing that we are engaged in right now is we're actually working with um, a group of Cal students who are conducting surveys um, for uh, all of our distributions and all of our clients in the hopes of gaining um, more concrete answers to the exact questions that you raised. And one thing that I evaluate every single day is, am I making a decision out of truth or am I making a decision out of my personal presumption? And I am trying to eliminate my personal presumption always, right? Because as Esther indicated at the beginning of this, right, her diet growing up was geographically specific to that region. Um, and, and, and we all have different dietary realities based off of that. So I think it's super important to, as best as we can, understand the client's preferences of who we're serving and then try to align our sourcing practices to accommodate that. I know that's hard. In food banking, we're, we're always kind of faced with really difficult decisions. Um, and sometimes it's, it's unfortunately saying no to a product or saying no to distributing a product that in terms of downstream health outcomes are objectively negative. Um, so I think there's no one size fits all solution I do think it's really about getting as much feedback and as much input from the communities that we're serving as possible, and then gradually iterating how we're sourcing our food um, to accommodate those needs. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%, Holden. Um, my personal experience with that with students has been to always go in the inclusive mindset versus exclusive. So I know that I'm trying to you know, up the nutritional value of the food that they're consuming, but I need to always, you know, make sure I'm not telling people, take this out of your diet, take that out, take that. And I was like, no, just try to add some more of this in and add some more of that. If you can, if it's affordable, if you can, you know, if it makes sense. And, and also just by, you know, from, from when I leave the library to on my way home, like I can pass at least, hmm, I think I counted like 25 uh, folks using tents on the streets and um, and the times that I've gone up to people because I like to carry food on me all the time. And I'm like, hey, you want, you know, an apple, you want a tangerine and not everybody's always going to say yes to that, you know, and so just figuring out, um, well, if they don't want the food, I'm going to give them like what other resource, you know, can I have um, the brochures in my bag to say, you know, can you get to the library so I can help you figure out how to get this food, you know, this EBT card, or um, can you get to the food bank on this day? You know, like if we all had like little cards to be able to pass out to people that we see, um, because a lot of times people just don't know where, you know, where to go for it too. So, um, but yeah, anybody else want to respond to that question, Anna, Natalie? I was just going to say with, um, with Holden and BFN's real uh, focus on client choice, that's a great model. That's such a respectful model. Um, and I think it sort of just, you know, partially uh, promotes that, that just the diversity and the, the interest of what folks have just as individuals. 
um, you know, our programs are a little more limited. We have a we have an a menu. That is that is the meal of that day, um, and we try to make the full menu pretty diverse. Um, and it's we know we're still excluding people, so you know you do you do the best you can within your parameters, and you keep sort of looking for other ways. Do you add supplemental groceries? Do you do other things to sort of just stretch what you can what you can offer? So. Well, we're coming up against the end of our time today, but I just want to thank each of you, Natalie, Anna, and Holden, Esther, for taking time to um, discuss this issue with the library community. Um, and we will be putting this all on uh, the library's YouTube page in the coming days. So um, feel free to refer people to that page to, so they can watch the discussion. Um, and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank, thank you. you. All right. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And um, I think there's a Dungeons and Dragons program starting at 3. So uh, maybe we'll see you there. All right. Bye. Bye.